Welcome to the University of Bristol Botanic Garden. My name's Nick Ray and I'm the curator of the Botanic Garden. And today we're going to be looking at one of our core collections, the plants that come from the world's Mediterranean climatic zones. There are five Mediterranean climatic zones around the world and they occupy the area around the Mediterranean Sea, so that's southern and southeastern Europe and parts of North Africa, western and parts of southern Australia, western California, uh, central Chile, and today we're going to have a close look at the plants and the ecology of the southwestern tip of South Africa. Now this small part of South Africa, which in itself is a large country, represent 0.05% of the world's landmass, yet it contains 3% of all the world's flora. So there's an immense amount of diversity in a very small space. This small area of Africa represents just half a percent of the landmass of the African continent, yet it contains 20% of the plant species. One of the factors that's led to this diversity is the different geological mixes that we find in the Western Cape. Perhaps the geological type that predominates is sandstone, and it's home to some of the oldest sandstones on the planet, laid down between 200 220 and 250 million years ago. And the dominant type of sandstone is a geology called Table Mountain Sandstone, which forms a mountain belt called the Cape Fold Mountains. Now we haven't been able to replicate the exact geological type, but what we've done is look into the UK geology and find the oldest sandstone uh, rocks in the UK and then we've sourced two of those types of rock and brought them into this display. Now these are a little bit younger, they were laid down about 200 million years ago. And the first one here is a rock type from County Durham called Catskill Grit. And the thing that I really want you to see here is these large quartzite crystals. And this is typical of Table Mountain sandstone that you would get in the Western Cape of South Africa are these large grained quartzite crystals. It's extremely hard and very slow to weather. There's another similar sandstone, but we're gonna have a look at it now. Um, if I walk through the display, over here, the first thing you'll notice is that the sandstone here is of a different color. It's very red and rich in color, and to touch is extremely rough. This is a large grained, iron rich, iron oxide rich sandstone. It's a little bit younger than the large quartzite grained sandstone, but this is also a typical feature of the geology of the Western Cape. Now, in amongst these um, sandstone formations, we also get a type of rock which is slightly softer called malms with shales and that leads to a more fertile soil on which we get a vegetation type called Rhinostobos. We also get the intrusion of granite uh, uh, plumes and domes which extrude upwards. These are extremely hard and it's difficult for plants to form a community on these granite rocks but in the uh, cracks and dikes in amongst the rocks there we get deposits and often that forms a great opportunity for plants to establish. Plants like this uh, Watsonia here, Watsonias are typically found uh, either in wet seeps and wet deposits or in the moist cracks within rocks, like for example, some of the uh, granite um, hills or copies as they're known in South Africa. Now, this sandstone in our display here at the University of Botanic Garden has been planted up with a community of plants which collectively form a habitat known as Fainbos or Fine Bush. Um, it was named by the uh, first Dutch settlers to the Cape and they noted 
the diversity of the plant communities here and the fact that many of them had very very fine small leaves and um, they were unpalatable to the stock that had been introduced by them but um, nevertheless this community of plants supports a great diversity of, of animals but if we go back to the rocks the rocks are really hard and they're slow to weather so the minerals in the rocks are leached out very very slowly and over time um, there's been a depletion of minerals in the soils so this plant community here grows in very nutrient uh, low soils and that's one of the unique factors about the Fainbos community so plants like this member of the Protea family here Leucodendron these have evolved to have specialist mechanisms to get the nutrients they need out of the soil and one nutrient uh, potassium is particularly low in Fainbos uh, communities on the um, uh, predominantly acid soils that they grow on and so these plants have evolved to grow in very very low uh, potassium uh, environments and in fact if we were to add that nutrient to the soil we're more than likely to kill these plants. So let's have a little look more at some of the diversity within the plants in this Fainbos community. The typical climate of a Mediterranean climatic zone is warm, wet winters, often with quite high rainfall during the winter months. Uh, that goes on until early spring, but then there's a cessation in the rainfall. And from late spring into summer, right the way through to early autumn, there's no rainfall. And often there's cloudless blue skies, and a lot of these Mediterranean climates are associated with strong winds created by thermal currents during the summer months. So um, there's a huge amount of evapotranspiration, evaporation from the soil surface, transpiration from the plants, and no rainfall. So it's the summer period in the Mediterranean climate that is the dormant time. And these plants have to survive that challenging period. And they've evolved many successful and interesting strategies to deal with that. And one is this uh, a group of plants here called uh, ericas. Uh, and there are many plants with small leaves in the Fainbos biome but ericas are very heavily represented. In fact, there's around about uh, 650 species of erica growing on the planet. Uh, in South Africa, there are 580 species, but in Western Cape alone, there's about 420 species of erica or heather. If you compare that to Europe, all of continental Europe, we just have 14 species. And here you see very small, hard leaves, well adapted to conserving moisture. The leaves are all over the stem. Often the flowers are hard and dry petals or waxy petals, again able to um, uh, uh, conserve water loss. Um, the ericas are evergreen, but the total mass of all these small leaves is quite small. Now, another strategy is, which you can see in this helichrysum here, is light reflecting hairs. Now these have the effect, the twofold effect. One, they act as a type of sunscreen, so they will reflect some of the light that comes from the sun back out to space, which is why we can see them as bright white and silver plants. But also, these hairs trap a blanket of air right against the epidermal layer of cells on the leaves. And that acts as a transition zone between the low moisture air here to the higher moisture air that you would get in the stomatal cavity in the leaves. And so it acts as a buffer zone between the two. And this helps moderate the plant's water loss during the summer period. Now another strategy to conserve moisture is found here in this shrubby species. This, is, this plant is called a Ginidia and Ganidias are one of the endemic genera to um, South Africa. Endemism refers to an organism that lives just in a local area. 
And the thing you notice about this is that the leaves are all pointing upwards. So that's unusual. They're not, po not pointing to face the sun to capture the maximum uh, amount of uh, sunlight for f manufacturing food. They're pointing directly up. In fact, they're pointing to the midday sun. This is so that they show the minimum surface area to the midday sun when the sun is at its hottest. And in doing this, it prevents the leaves from overheating and losing excess moisture. So the sun is, that is now beating now in morning time on this side of the leaves and at the end of the day it will hit this side of the leaves. So morning and at the end of the day is when this plant um, photos, does most of its photosynthetic activity. And if we look at the bud tip you can see the leaves are very tightly oppressed at the tip right to the very tip so that tip is protected from the sun when it's its strongest at midday. Now this leaf arrangement has a special name, it's called an isobilateral leaf arrangement and it's not only Ganidia that it's seen in, we see this in many genera uh, growing in and uh, not just only the Fainbos but in many of the other habitats that we find in South Africa and in fact out of South Africa into many of the other Mediterranean climatic zones. A little bit closer to home in Europe we see this in olive and filaria they point their leaves up to the midday sun, uh, but there's a lot of plants in South Africa that have this leaf arrangement. And from a gardening perspective, it's quite aesthetic and um, it makes for an interesting feature uh, in this display. Now, another adaptation to a long, hot, dry season is hiding below ground. Now, there are many bulbous plants with swollen bulbs or plants with storage corms and root or stem tubers that store their water and their carbohydrates below ground away from the midday heat and many of these plants become dormant during the uh, long hot summer period and this plant Tolbagia violacea which is a member of the onion family the Aliaceae and I can smell the allicin, the, the smell of onions coming off the, the broken leaves of this plant. This plant in moist, moisture conditions, maybe at the side of a, a, a perennial stream, will remain evergreen, but in extreme conditions it will go completely deciduous and then regrow again uh, in the autumn. Now the collective term for these storage organs underneath the ground, the bulbs, the corms, the tubers, these plants are collectively known as geophytes and hiding below ground to get away from uh, that summer dormant period um, is a very successful strategy and so much so that um, there's more species of geophytes uh, in the western Cape of South Africa than all the other Mediterranean climatic regions of the world combined. It really is an eye-watering amount of diversity. It makes it a very exciting place um, to actually explore and, and look at the plants. Now some of those plants are too tender for us to grow outside here at the University of Bristol Botanic Garden but they're represented uh, beautifully in our glasshouse displays um, where now at the end of summer uh, into autumn many of them are flowering before the leaves emerge and then the leaves grow through the winter and then they become dormant during the summer months. So we grow many of those plants in pots for easy care and cultivation but there's a few, like the Tolbagia, that we grow outside. So, these different strategies uh, help these plants survive the dormant period. But there's an even extreme version. This um, leafy green, well it appears leafy, but on closer inspection, these are not feathery green leaves, these are actually green stems. In fact, this plant is almost leafless. Technically, there's a few leaf-like structures on some species, but mainly it's the green stems that are doing all the photosynthesis. This is a group of plants known as the Restios. The plant family is Restionaceae. 
There's about 280 or so species worldwide. Um, there's 18 in, in Australia, there's one in Chile, and all the rest are found in South Africa. And in fact, they're so dominant and so diverse that um, they dictate the presence of the Fainbos community. So if you're walking in the mountains and you're in amongst restios, you know that you're in Fainbos. If there's an absence of restios, then you have moved out of Fainbos and you're into one of the other ecological uh, niches. This is a fascinating group of plants. Um, some um, will re-sprout after a flower, after a fire, and some will regrow from seed after a fire. And in fact, this whole uh, Fainbos community is a fire dependent community. So fire is part of the natural life cycle. And when those fires occur, and in nature they're naturally started by um, lightning strikes, lightning bolts coming um, at the change of the seasons when the atmosphere is disturbed. Uh, of course, with the, um, uh, with the advent of modern man, they're now started illegally or accidentally. And the oils in the plants mean that this, this plant material burns very, very fast and very hot for a very short period of time. As the firewall moves on, then um, the plants will start to regrow. This plant, Canamoas, is a re-sprouter, so it will regrow after the fire has killed all the stems of above ground. And, um, uh, and also, the seed that is being lying dormant in the soil surface will be triggered to regrow after the fire. And it's not the heat of the fire which is causing uh, that uh, germination, it's the chemical cues contained in the mix of smoke by burning these Feinbos plants that provide the germination cues for that seed. Uh, I remember traveling uh, in the Western Cape uh, about 20 years ago through a mountain range and around about 20 miles of the road I was driving on, the mountains on either side were completely burnt. There wasn't a scrap of green. And I drove back through the same valley uh, two weeks later and there's a rash of trillions of seedlings um, and all the mountainsides looked like a, a snooker table, a billiard table, verdant and green with new growth coming through. Now, these have small um, uh, flowers, um, uh, almost petalless flowers that appear brown to our eyes um, and they have um, small nut-like seeds. Um, there is a species of Canamoas, which has a variety Gigantia, that has um, large flower structures uh, and seeds. These are female flowers because we have uh, separate sexes on different individuals. And Canamoas var Gigantia has a small pea-like uh, brown or black nut. And on one side, is a fatty deposit. It's white in colour and it looks like a tube of toothpaste is being squeezed out on the dark seed surface. It's called an eliosome and it's rich in fat and vitamins. And on a hot summer's day, the seed capsules will crack open, the heavy seeds will fall to the ground and they're collected by ants. And those ants will pick up all the seed, take it off to their little burrows and nests and they'll put those seeds into their larder and through the long hot summer months they will eat the eliosome and feed it, regurgitate it and feed it to their, their brood but they have no interest in the seed once the eliosome has been exhausted and so they will just landfill the seed in their empty galleries of their nest. Now this process can go on for years, in fact decades, until there's a bushfire. And when that bushfire comes, the chemicals will leach into the soil. And when it rains, the chemicals are dissolved in the rainwater and the seeds will germinate after a long dormancy. And we see a forest of activity. So it's a really interesting group of plants. There's one other species I need to show you which uh, has a very practical use, and it's here. Perhaps the first thing you notice is there's a great sound, a very subtle percussion sound given off by this plant as it blows in the wind. 
This is a type of restio called Elegia tectorum. And um, you can see, unlike the Canamoa such as showed you, here these uh, stems are leafless and they're single and unbranched. Uh, this particular plant is a male and we've got the inflorescent structures at, at the tip. But what's interesting here are these hard stems. These were traditionally harvested by the native peoples in South, Western Cape of South Africa for thousands of years and woven into matting to make their small dome-shaped dwellings which could easily be broken down and moved as they followed the rains. The first Dutch, Dutch settlers saw this activity and harnessed um, the use of this particular restio, Elegia tectorum, for thatching uh, the roofs of their farmsteads and the embryonic buildings forming uh, what would go on to be the settlement of Cape Town. Uh, today, uh, these plants are still harvested um, effectively from the wild. They're cut with a strimmer once every seven years. It takes seven years to get the plant grown back like this. And um, there are huge farms which have a natural rotation, cutting this, drying, stacking it, and grading it, and then it's sold as thatching material. So this is the cape reed or the thatching reed. Uh, it's harvested in the southern cape uh, near the town of Bredarsdorp uh, in the southern Overberg. And um, it's a renewable resource. It's a really hard, durable thatch. These stems are actually filled with fibers, so they're quite heavy. And we've used, imported and used this material to be faithful to our design in our South African display and that's what you see today on the roof of this beautiful Rondavel. You can't overstate the uh, profound effect that autumn has in the Mediterranean climate with a surge of growth. Plants like these amaryllis here planted against this stone wall uh, a shelter position, the wall faces west, probably the most sheltered part of the Botanic Garden here in Bristol. Um, but all that stored energy below ground, um, the hormone change, switching the growth pattern from dormant to actually grow and bursting that new growth up into making the most of the autumn light. And one group of plants here, the Watsonias, are a member of the Iris family. In fact, Iris is not represented in South Africa but the iris family, the iridaceae, is heavily represented. Uh, Watsonia, Ferrara, Ixia, just to name just a few. Casmanthi, uh, just to name just a few of the genera. Well, those plants have been dormant all summer and now they're bursting into growth. And it, it presents a paradox for us as horticulturalists here at the Botanic Garden because a lot of the plants in the garden are going dormant and these are now coming into growth. And the reason why we use walls and shelter is because if we do get some hard frost, uh, some of these plants will be damaged. The very tender elements of them are lifted each autumn and put in a cool glass house where the frost is just kept out. It's a lot of work, but it does mean that we can augment this display. Anyway, now we're going to a different ecological niche, and that is the shrubby karoo. So, we leave the, uh, the fame boss behind and uh, we come into a more arid area, more, even more arid than the Mediterranean mountains. As the uh, Cape Fold Mountains uh, uh, run from uh, uh, west to east, some 450 miles, they split and form an ellipse. And in that ellipse is the Little Karoo. North of those mountains, what are known as the Swartberg Mountains, is the Great Karoo, a huge area, uh, rich in annuals, bulbous, and um, uh, uh, xerophytic shrubs adapted to a seasonally dry environment. Here, we're showing a number of plant species. This found in the Karoo, in many of the, the, the small hills in the Karoo. This is um, uh, Stebe plumosa, and one of the things you'll notice about it is that um, the leaves, the stems and the flower buds are covered 
in minute hairs. There's also waxy deposits here which reflect the light, giving this fantastic uh, colour uh, uh, here. Um, this is uh, drought tolerant, uh, perhaps to the extreme. Lower down as we get near the coast, we find plants like Pazarina. This is Pazarina rigida. And here the leaves are tiny scale-like structures which are pressed to the stem. They're set in waxy uh, coverings on the stem, beautifully adapted to a seasonally dry environment. And also by the coast, let's not forget that South Africa sticks out into uh, the South Atlantic and uh, the southern part of the Indian Ocean on the eastern side. So this adaptation means that they're well adapted to wind, extreme wind conditions. We move on up and um, here we find um, a beautiful exquisite garden plant. This is found uh, in the lower reaches, not the mountains, but the lower reaches when we come out of Feinbos into the uh, uh, ecological niche uh, known as Renosta felt. Um, we can find patches of this plant, Melianthus major. And you can see it has, uh, we've been looking at small leaves and this has broad leaves, but they're covered in wax to reflect the light and reduce water loss and uh, protect them, the leaf tissue inside from damage from ultraviolet light. Now these plants will get quite tall, they'll get to two, perhaps in some situations three meters and they'll throw up in winter and early spring a tall inflorescence which can be as high as 2.5 to 3 meters in height and that has a maroon, a port wine, burgundy brown bracts and flowers, uh, sometimes known as the honey flower because of the rich nectar that it produces. It's pollinated um, by sugar and sunbirds and in fact so much of the South African flora is pollinated by sugar and sunbirds. In fact bird pollination is uh, a major uh, a factor in the pollination of many of these plants and as the rain patterns move from west to east and then at the end of summer uh, uh, we get thunderstorms which provide rains. You get these sporadic flowerings of different species and birds will migrate around following the rain patterns and following the flowering. One such plant that's flowering now in autumn which is widespread in the southern and eastern Cape is the lion's head flower or Leonotus Leonurus. Um, sometimes here at the Botanic Garden this is frosted before it can flower but if you look at these emerging flowers and see the hairs that are on each uh, flower it's remarkable this hairy structure the orange colour um, attracts uh, uh, sunbirds the rigid stem here is strong enough for the birds to land and then this slightly curved flower is perfectly shaped and mirrors the shape of the sunbird beak and they'll stick their tongue down in here and slurp out the nectar and move on to the next flower. So let's be clear when we talk about bird pollination people often think about hummingbirds but they're exclusively found in the Americas. That role of bird pollination is uh, done by this big group of birds called sugar and sunbirds. There are other bird families and groups that do bird pollination in southern and South Africa but they're a very very important component and this plant with its square stem and um, plants with square stem like this one are in the mint family the Lamiaceae. So we will uh, protect this uh, over the next month um, to prevent the plants from dying. We may lose some of the shoots but the plants themselves hopefully will survive. Um, but you can see with the new growth, it's just coming into growth. These small, low-growing plants with these cheerful little daisy flowers 
uh, osteospermums and this genus is widespread in South Africa but it's frequently found in Namaqualand which is a seasonally dry uh, but in winter and spring uh, which in South Africa is August and July August maybe the first week of September uh, these plants can bloom in great profusion along with many other annuals and short-lived um, perennials like um, the cinnias and dimothicas and arctotis they have these cheerful colors over the landscape in great profusion the advantage of flowering all at once means that you can attract a lot of pollinators and hopefully successfully pollination and seed um, here with our climate in Bristol these these plants are, are, are perennial and they, they overwinter but it's a small part of the display devoted to kind of illustrating the landscape in this uh, seasonally floriferous area known as Namwakwa land. We couldn't really um, talk about South African plants without talking about Pelagonium. There's about 276 or so species of Pelagoniums worldwide. All bar 11 of them are found growing in South Africa. And this one here with these large leaves with a, a lovely sort of purple ring on each one is perhaps one of the most common. This is Pelagonium zonale, which is found not only in the Western Cape, uh, but also in the Southern Cape. And it's typically found in Namaqualand, but also uh, shrubby Karoo uh, habitats. And it grows in cracks and rocks up in the kind of mountains, somewhere where it can get its roots in a cool rooting niche underneath a boulder. Here in Bristol, we grow it against this stone wall for winter protection. And they're growing now, they're in full growth now in autumn. And these plants, if they get through the winter, will get about a metre high and then they'll start to bloom with their characteristic pale pink flowers and have a long flowering time. So many of the plants in the Western Cape are endemic to the Western Cape. That is, they're only found there. But there are a few plants that have a wider distribution. And perhaps one of the great surprises is that throughout the mountains of South Africa, running from northeast down through the mountains and into the mountains of the Western Cape all the way to the Cape Peninsula where Cape Town is in certain ecological niches you can find this. This is the African olive and the ancestors of these plants perhaps were distributed by these fruits being eaten by birds and by migrating birds from north of the equator, uh, where olives are naturally found uh, today in the forests of Armenia, in the Caucasus, and then humans have taken olives and spread them around the Mediterranean zone of Europe and North Africa for their edible fruits and the oil they produced. But this particular species of olive, Olea europea, this one used to be called subspecies Africana, it's been recently been renamed, it's now subspecies uh, Cuspidata. This one's found in mountain niches all down the Rift Valley of East Africa and down from eastern part of South Africa into the Western Cape. I've seen this plant many times growing in um, hillsides in, in the Grey and the Little Karoo. It's not found in the Fainbos community, it's found in the Karooid scrub. Uh, it's unmistakably an olive and it grows uh, in and around Table Mountain in the Cape Peninsula where in those sites you look at the urban expanses of Cape Town. A plant that arrived many, many thousands if not millennia ago, distributed by birds, hopping from mountain top to mountain top, taking this northern hemisphere plant to the tip of Africa. South Africa remains one of the most interesting places on the planet to enjoy and study plants. Um, it's of great interest here in a botanic garden which is uh, planted for teaching, for research and for engagement of our local population about plants um, to have a display devoted 
to uh, showing uh, some of the many habitats that are found. For us, the Fainbos, the shrubby Karoo, the Namakwalan flora, and in the summer months we put out a few succulents here as a token gesture for uh, an ecological niche known as uh, the succulent Karoo. It remains a fascinating display and with our fairly benign climate and the use of this lovely stone wall facing west, uh, we can actually grow these plants out here all year round. It's a fascinating place to study and see plants and learn about a few surprises as well. I hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, this little short film about our South African plants growing outside here at the University of Bristol Botanic Garden. Uh, this is one of a series of little short films uh, that we're producing and um, uh, when the garden is open do come and enjoy these plants and uh, hopefully you'll look at them in a new light.